Welcome to Online Game Technology Drawn Badly. Thank you for joining me once again. In today's episode, we are going to talk about peer-to-peer -peer architectures. Um, we're talking about multiplayer games in this series so far and backend technology that powers them. So this is another architectural pattern that works well for some types of games um, and some types of technological requirements, but does come with some trade-offs. So let's talk about that. To set the stage, we've got a very similar scenario to what we had in the previous episode, where in, say, we have some kind of multiplayer game where maybe we have two players or two computers that want to talk to each other, uh, and they've got to share state between them. Maybe they're, in this particular instance, is a nice, that's my car, uh, and that's going forwards, right? And we need to tell a completely different computer that over here, this same car, is now doing the same thing, right? And so to do that, we need to share data between these two computers, ideally over the internet, right? This is my internet, uh, and that data comes back here, and vice versa, right? Like we want to go in both directions between the two. So why would you want to do a peer-to-peer -peer architecture? So in the classic example, and, and probably the most prevalent use case is say you only have two players, you just want to send data backwards and forwards between the two of them. That reduces the latency between the communications between the two computers because there's no intermediary, right? We don't have to, say, go off to some other process on the internet. We don't want to do that. We just want it to be between those two computers. That's great. On top of that as well, uh, this can mean, right, this isn't money, right? We don't have to spend money on this between these two computers. That's just internet traffic. So as a game developer, I don't care about that. Uh, that traffic that goes between, that's super, super cheap for me to do. So that can be a couple of really good reasons why I might necessarily want to do that. But it does get a little bit complicated. So say, for example, we have four players. So let's add a couple of players in here. There's a couple of different models I want to look at and some of the uh, pros and cons for each model so you can see what really is involved with doing this. So often when doing peer-to-peer -peer in this kind of scenario, um, what needs to happen is we need to have a central authority for this game is, is one pattern. So we will say like the, the player is host is, is sometimes what this is called. So usually uh, as part of the setting up of the game, we might designate that say one player here, say this one here is say that's our, our like acting basically acting like our game server and all the players connect to this individual machine right that means then the players can you know like my car over here can be running right same as everything else uh, and this person can have a completely different car right it's orange he has an orange car because why not and then another player you know she has a different colored car Right, and we can share that information all through um, this particular person's stuff. So this person can be sending data to here, which can then get translated out to here, and so on and so forth. Um, and that works very much like if we hosted this game server somewhere on the internet, but instead it's hosted on this one person's machine. And this works reasonably well. Um, we do want to talk about some of the downfalls here, but this works reasonably well because you know we can host it on a person's machine and that saves us a lot of money. So what are the uh, what are the problems that we have in this sort of environment? So the first problem that we want to talk about here is um, essentially cheating, uh, which is no fun at all. So first things first, right? This person here, this person here, this person here could all send any kind of data that they want. We have no control over that because players can be horrible. On top of that, the person who's hosting the server can also hack that to do whatever they want. So depending on how you determine what your authority is between all of these machines and what's happening inside the game can impact um, what's going on inside your game. And if, for example, there needs to be like a winner and loser in this game, some kind of tournament type scenario, this player here could be sending any kind of information back up to some kind of server in the cloud and you have no control over that whatsoever. That's one concern. Um, Another fun aspect of this is this player here actually gets a huge advantage. Um, they're sitting right next to that hosted game server, right? So they have essentially have um, they essentially have a latency of zero. 
right? So this then means that these other players here have to go all this way to send information, all this way to send information, all this way information, right? So maybe extra time. This player has to go bloop, and we're done. That's it. So they get a nice uh, benefit on, at this level to be able to say, oh, cool, right? I might actually choose or somehow manipulate environments so that I get that host player advantage. Now, depending on what sort of game you've got, maybe you've got a slower paced game. That doesn't necessarily matter. For your faster paced games, this is going to matter a lot. So one other problem that you're going to have to deal with uh, with peer-to-peer -peer architectures is something called host migration. So let me, let me start from scratch here just because this is going to be a little bit easier. So let's say we have our four computers all over the same way again, right? And we do this. These are my four computers, right? Um, and we have our host here. This is our host, right? All right he, that person's our host. And she's connected there, and he's connected there, and they're connected there. Excellent, right? And that's all perfect, right? Everything's working according to plan. Unfortunately, uh, the internet and people are unreliable. So you may have noticed that sometimes bad things happen. And so in some scenarios, that person may disappear. At which point, what do we do? Um, suddenly, the main source that we have for um, the authority in our game, this host right here, is gone away. So that means we need to make sure that as we're playing the game, we are somehow either replicating or making sure that the data is available so that we could move the host to any one of these number of machines so that we can reconfigure things all over again. Um, so usually if this happens, there's going to be some kind of hiccup in the system um, as we turn around and say, okay, so one of these players now has to be host again. So we'll choose one. There may be a variety of factors based on that. And then all of a sudden, we're going to like break all these connections that we had here and then be able to say, OK, let's reconnect our game all the way back here and then resync up all the data that we had to make sure it's appropriate. This is generally like in a peer to peer scenario somewhere that things can go horribly wrong. So it's something you need to be able to manage very carefully. Um, so think a lot about your gameplay and how your game works to manage these types of scenarios because they will definitely, definitely happen. So I want to cover um, one other type of scenario that can potentially happen uh, inside, inside a, a peer to peer scenario. So we're also going to start from scratch. So let's go back to our uh, model that we had before, which was where we had uh, two players, which again, super common, uh, very common, especially in fighting games. Uh, you want a peer-to-peer -peer environment so that you don't have to go to connection. But um, you're probably familiar with the fact that, uh, especially if you're at home or potentially on like your phone or something, you're going to have this thing called NAT that sits right in front of you know, some kind of firewall, some kind of router that is in front of your machine that controls the information that goes here. Or maybe you're sitting behind a corporate firewall um, and you don't necessarily know what's going on uh, and what's blocked and what's not. So in a peer-to-peer -peer environment, it is hugely important that you can send this data be from behind this NAT over here and back again. Unfortunately, sometimes that's just not possible. Sometimes you actually need, uh, you aren't able to do it. Maybe your NAT traversal is not just like not possible for a variety of reasons. Maybe there's a, f a firewall in there. And so when you do that, when you have that kind of scenario, sometimes you need what's commonly referred to as basically a little relay server. Call that a relay. So that when you send your traffic, it actually can bounce off the relay server onto the internet and come back down again. So there may necessarily be some infrastructure that you need to run on the internet so that you can always make sure that that information can get relayed around uh, from one machine to another. If there's some issue, for example, at the firewall level, maybe like here or here, depending on your setup. This can definitely be true, especially in mobile game scenarios, but can definitely also be true in any other types of games as well, depending on how a home network is set up, because who knows how these things are set up, how old routers are, what sort of firewall information they have set up, um, that kind of fun stuff as well. So this will require a little bit of money to do that, but it's much less than, say, a dedicated game server. But 
do be aware that you will need to handle all those sort of scenarios like host migration and um, cheating aspects that are our particular concern as well with doing peer-to-peer -peer type stuff. Okay, so let's kind of sum that up because it is an interesting one. When do I want to use peer-to-peer? So I would break this down for a couple of scenarios. So games where cheating doesn't matter. That's probably number one. Uh, maybe a game in which if somebody hacks the system, they're only gonna see the difference themselves. That's totally fine too. Um, perfect, perfect scenario uh, for using peer-to-peer. -peer. 1v1 games, I think is also a perfect scenario uh, for peer-to-peer, -peer, but you are gonna wanna have some kind of relay server. Uh, and we're gonna talk a little bit about relay servers in a later episode. Finally, maybe a slower type game. And I say that because um, you are gonna have to handle that host migration issue inside a peer-to-peer -peer scenario. In a faster paced game, that hiccup, that break can be uh, disruptive, but in a slower type game, maybe a turn-based game, something like that, it could be something that uh, is quite bearable or could be hidden inside gameplay. So there you have it, a short breakdown on peer-to-peer -peer architectures inside games. If you have questions, make sure to drop them in the comments below. You can follow me on Twitter at Neurotic. Uh, you can see me on Twitch doing some open source backend game dev at Mark Mandel. Uh, and obviously you can find me here on YouTube at Mark S. Mandel. Please don't forget to like and subscribe to the video if you appreciate it. I'm gonna put out a bunch more videos about backend game technology. So thank you very much for listening and I hope to see you again soon.